The New Guinea highlands stand out as one of Earth's toughest terrains. Spanning a thousand miles, this mountain range slices through the island, reaching heights of 16,000 feet with jagged peaks and ridges that seem almost impassable. Even just getting to the foothills, which are already thousands of feet high, is a grueling journey through marshes and tropical forests in the lowlands. It wasn't until the 1930s that outsiders, Europeans and Australians, realized the hidden bounty within these seemingly hostile mountains. Despite their forbidding appearance, the valleys nestled within were thriving with life. These valleys were home to numerous sedentary agricultural communities, not just a few struggling foragers, but large villages cultivating crops and tending to livestock. Over thousands of years, these groups coexisted, competed, and occasionally clashed in wars. Despite their challenging reputation, the highlands boast a unique ecological niche. Evergreen rainforests blanket the slopes up to around 5,000 feet, giving way to mixed forests and high meadows beyond that. Altitude dictates the flora and fauna available, offering resources for those willing to traverse the hills and valleys. This lifestyle persisted for millennia, with evidence of habitation dating back over 20,000 years. Around 10,000 years ago, a significant shift occurred in the New Guinea highlands as people began experimenting with agriculture. Unlike their previous foraging lifestyle, they started actively cultivating plants, creating gardens and artificial landscapes to meet their dietary needs. Surprisingly, the highlands were among the few places globally where agriculture originated independently. The question arises, why change a lifestyle that had sustained them for thousands of years? This question is not unique to New Guinea, but resonates across various regions during the early Holocene epoch, which commenced approximately 11,700 years ago. Around this time, agricultural developments were taking place in different parts of the world, from the Fertile Crescent to Mesoamerica, South Asia, and beyond. The reasons behind this agricultural revolution likely relate to shifts in climate, whether towards greater variability or stability. Although pinpointing the exact cause remains challenging, in the New Guinea highlands, the transition to agriculture was likely prompted by changes in climate and the evolving landscape. Previously, foragers residing at around 5,000 feet elevation enjoyed access to diverse food sources where high forests met mountain grasslands. However, with the warming and increased rainfall of the Holocene, rainforests expanded up the hillsides, pushing the high forests higher and rendering open meadows inaccessible. Faced with these environmental changes, people had to decide between migrating higher or embracing a new way of life. At a site known as Kuk Swamp, nestled in the upper Wagi Valley of the Eastern Highlands, people opted for a new approach around 10,000 years ago. They began by clearing mountain forest from the valley floor, likely using fire. Next, they dug small channels and built up earth onto raised mounds where they planted their crops, securing them to stakes or posts to prevent submersion in the swamp's waters. After a brief stay, perhaps a couple of years, they moved on to another location where they likely repeated the process. This agricultural method is known as shifting cultivation, well suited to the nutrient poor soils and rapid depletion common in tropical regions. Over time, practicing shifting cultivation transforms the landscape, creating a mix of older forests, regrowth on recently cultivated plots, and open land under current cultivation. This diverse landscape offers numerous benefits for mobile farming communities. Their crops of choice included yams, bananas, and taro, all native to the highlands, if not to that exact elevation. Interestingly, the highlands likely served as the original homeland of the widely consumed domesticated banana, now enjoyed worldwide. For a period, shifting cultivation was the norm around Cook Swamp. However, by around 5000 BC, this practice became unsustainable, necessitating a shift to more permanent cultivation methods. This transition is evident at Cook Swamp, where instead of moving between patches, people settled down and began digging small regular mounds, each a few feet across. The lower spaces between the mounds acted as drainage channels to remove excess rain and floodwaters. Taro, which thrives in wet conditions, was planted on the edges of the mounds, while bananas and sugarcane, intolerant of waterlogged soil, were planted at the center. This innovative approach created a large artificial environment capable of supporting a permanent population. Over the following millennia, inhabitants at Kook Swamp continued to refine their agricultural practices, eventually digging large drainage ditches to further enhance cultivation. Kook Swamp stands as clear evidence of the independent invention of a sophisticated agricultural system, 
distinct from practices observed elsewhere in the world. Two intriguing aspects stand out about Kook Swamp and its context. Firstly, the archaeological findings there diverge from the conventional grandeur associated with ancient sites. Instead of elaborate temples or pottery, the remnants consist of subtle imprints in the mud, minuscule charcoal fragments, and microscopic plant remains. While seemingly unremarkable, these artifacts require sophisticated archaeological techniques developed over decades to weave together a compelling narrative of the distant past. Secondly, the introduction of agriculture in the highlands did not follow the typical trajectory towards craft specialization, urbanization, or complex social structures observed elsewhere. Despite the growth of villages and populations, and the emergence of influential figures known as big men, the region did not undergo the transition to what many perceive as civilization. State formation remained absent, and conflict and violence between groups persisted without a clear linear progression from agricultural innovation to societal advancement, setting New Guinea apart from other civilizations. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, a handful of plant species like sweet potato, cassava, and tobacco were brought from the Americas by Europeans and introduced to Indonesia, later spreading to New Guinea. In the latter half of the 19th century, particularly after 1870, additional crops were directly introduced by Europeans, such as beans, pumpkin, corn, watermelon, papaya, mangosteen, durian, orange, lemon, coffee, lime, and guava. The arrival of sweet potato in Papua New Guinea had a profound impact, leading to significant societal changes among those who adopted it as a staple food. Its versatility as pig fodder, requiring no cooking, made it particularly valuable for pig farming. Consequently, early adopters of sweet potato cultivation could quickly accumulate pigs and amass considerable wealth compared to those who did not embrace the new crop. Oral traditions of the Enga people record these societal shifts resulting from sweet potato cultivation. By the 1930s, European records documented that sweet potato had become the primary food source for nearly all highland communities, except those west of the Strickland River, who still relied primarily on taro. By the 1980s, even the most resistant groups had transitioned to a diet centered around sweet potato. While some Papua New Guineans believe their ancestors always had access to sweet potatoes, others, like those in the Tari Basin, have oral traditions recounting their previous dependence on taro.